All right, well, the commandment this morning, the reading is short. The exposition may be a little bit more lengthy than this, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll find it encouraging. And by the way, you know that um, the Lord, more often than not, uh, couched the commandments in a negative way. Uh, and the Lord knows human nature, doesn't He? Because the tendency is to do these things. But we need to remember that for every negative commandment, there's a positive flip side to it. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And what he is saying here, of course, is you must honor him. And he puts it in a positive way in the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Okay? May your name be honored and glorified and reverenced. And let's not forget, it's not just the name that we're concerned about because the name is the designation of a person. And however you treat the name, you're treating the person. So that's why this is so important. But here's the commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Well, uh, again, there's a lot of things that can be said. Not everything can be said. So let me just plow ahead. We have been looking at God's purpose in loving us from all eternity in the first place and sending His Son for us. And that was that we might do what He originally made us to do. Okay, he made Adam and Eve perfect. He gave them His Spirit. He made them to love Him. And they lost that. Okay, the work of redemption is to reverse the curse and to bring us back to what He originally intended us to be, and that is to be holy and to be sanctified, uh, to be sinless, to love Him from a pure heart. One day that's going to happen, not here. We're not going to reach sinless perfection here, but we will in heaven. He wants us to be like His Son. His Son lived the kind of life He wants us to live. And we know the kind of life Jesus lived was that of one who loved Him with all His heart. Now, knowing that this is the goal, we began to look at how Jesus loved His Father, how He worshipped His God. He did this first by keeping His commandments, and that's why we're looking at the commandments. And again, remember, the commandments, it's not, they're not a series of, of things that say, do this or don't do this or you're going to get it. Okay, that's, that's not the purpose of it. And it's certainly not given to us as, you know, a, a law of works by which we can save ourselves, justify ourselves, but really it's a law that is given to us to show us how to love God for having redeemed us, you know, how to love Him in return for His mercies toward us. And so we're, we're trying to understand them in that way, and we're, we're trying to understand a little bit of the breadth of these commandments. So what we've seen so far is that Jesus... According to the first commandment, worship God as his God. He put him first in his heart, first in his life. He loved him and served him above all else, devoting himself fully to him and to his cause. That's what it means to have God as your God. He's the one you serve. He is the one you're devoted to, which is why we need to love him most of all. That's what Jesus did. Secondly, he worshiped or he served God in the way that God commands in his word. Second commandment, remember, not making graven images, uh, is really a prescription of how God will not be worshiped, but we know there's a flip side to that. God wants to be worshiped in a certain way, and we saw that Jesus did that. As a youth, up until he was 30 and began his ministry, he would go to the synagogue he would listen to the prayers and he would say his amen. He would hear the reading of the law and the reading of the prophets and he would listen to the exposition and he would receive that word and live by it. He would praise him through psalms and receive the benediction and that's going to be a very important part of what it means of not to take the Lord's name in vain because the benediction is, is, a, is connected to that, we're going to see. And, of course, when Jesus began his ministry, he continued to worship the Lord according to his will um, in the synagogue, only this time he was the one who did the reading and the preaching, okay? He was the traveling rabbi. So he worshiped God according to his command in public worship, and he also worshiped him more broadly 
by living according to God's every word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now remember, the Apostle Paul tells us that all of life is to be worshipped. That our task is to present to ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And again, you know, the offerer, when they offered a, a sacrificial animal to the Lord, they didn't just pull it back and, you know, after it was done being sacrificed, although there were certain sacrifices that they could eat of, but they were giving it to God. And when we offer ourselves as sacrifices to God, we are giving ourselves to Him. It, you know, Paul goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may know what the will of God is, you know, how you may serve Him in an acceptable way as you lay your life down on His altar as a sacrifice. Jesus, of course, did that as well. And that's what we are called to do, to follow His example. Now, these first two commandments really summarize everything that Jesus was all about, loving God with His whole heart and serving Him with His whole life. Now, that again is why the Lord saved us, that we might do the same. Eric Little, remember the, um, the runner in the Olympics who was also the missionary in China? If you've seen Chariots of Fire, you know something about his life. He put it this way, God wants from us complete surrender. Any area of our lives not surrendered to Him, that's just rebellion against God. You know, we need to give it all to Him. Again, that's what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 12. Now, the commandments that follow, the first and second commandment, just simply spell this out more fully, what it means to love, what it means to serve God according to His Word, what it means to give our lives completely to Him. This morning, we're going to look at the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, the first thing we need to ask is, what is God calling us to do here? And um, in the words themselves, but we want to see how it expands, okay? Okay. First of all, he's telling us that when we use his name, that we must use it reverently, okay? We revere him. Again, as we also pray in the first petition, hallowed be your name. We're not just saying that other people would do this. We're saying that we also would do this. Now, the first thing that he has in view is the thing I've already told you about, and that is when we take an oath or when we make a vow. Our meditation was really a commentary on this commandment, you shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Swear falsely, okay? That means that whatever it is you're swearing, and we're going to look at what that means, you're not doing it intending actually to carry it out if it's a vow, or believing that what you're saying is true if it happens to be an oath. Now, we know that swearing an oath is something the Jews would do if they were called to bear witness in, in courts, you know, in the gates of the elders. And we know something about that because that practice is really carried on today. Any culture that's really been influenced by Christianity has something that's known as swearing in witnesses. Now, we know that it used to be that a witness was required when sworn in to place their hand on a Bible, okay, and solemnly affirm that they would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. And what they meant by that was they were calling God to bear witness to the truth or falsity of their testimony. To take an oath and then break it by lying would be to swear falsely and to profane God's name. And the Lord says there is actually a, um, a sanction that's connected with that. The Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, I, you know, I was just recently in a courtroom. I was not a witness. Thankfully, I was not on trial by God's grace. Uh, but I was a juror, and I, I was able to see the, um, the different goings-on in the court, and I realized that with the continuing separation of church and state, things have changed just a bit. This oath, for instance, now the oath is this. Do you promise that what you are about to say is true under penalty of perjury? In other words, instead of you know, you better be careful because God's going to hold you accountable to this. You need to be careful because the state's going to hold you accountable. And the state has taken the place of God. But it's still a threat. It's meant to get them to take seriously what they're doing. Now, we need to remember what Jesus teaches us. 
Whether we call on God to bear witness to what we're saying or not, He still bears witness to what we say. So we need to speak the truth. Let our yes be yes, let our no be no. Now this commandment also requires that we be sincere in the swearing of vows. And, you know, the difference between an oath and a vow, I guess, you know, an oath is where you swear to the truth or falsity or something. A vow is where you say, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do it. You know, we have examples of things in Scripture. I think of the oath between Laban, you know, Jacob's father-in-law and Jacob. When they made that uh, covenant of Mizpah, they set up a stone and they made a promise. They made a vow. I'm not going to pass by this stone to hurt you and you're not going to pass by this stone to hurt me. And that's how there's going to be peace between our two families. Well, that's, that's what vows are. Um, this commandment requires that when we take a vow, and we swear a vow, that we must do what we have promised. We need to be sincere in this. Now, those of us who are married, we've made vows, haven't we? To love and to cherish and to honor our spouse till death to us part. Now, we need to keep that vow, okay? We need to keep that vow because we made it before God, and we need to keep it even if our spouse doesn't keep it, right? We still need to do it. It's not, you know, um, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth when it comes to the marriage relationship. If, if I get injured, I don't return injury. I still am bound to do what I have promised I'm going to do and all of us who are married, and that's really how the marriage holds together, isn't it? That's um, at least in... It'll certainly help a great deal. Those of us who are members of this church have both taken oaths and made vows, okay? And I thought it would be helpful. You know, we haven't received a new member for a while, and when we do that, we were encouraged to think about what, what they're swearing to, what they're, the, the oaths they're taking, the vows they're taking, because we've made those if we're members. Uh, and we can kind of renew ours before the Lord. So if we are members of this church, this is what we've done. First of all, we've affirmed that we believe the Bible to be God's Word, which shows us the only way of salvation. This is the only way. Secondly, that the triune God is the only true God, and that Jesus is the Son of God who came into this world in our nature to save us. And then thirdly, that we've repented of all of our sins and are trusting in Jesus alone for our salvation. In other words, we're swearing an oath to the fact that we believe the gospel. Okay, that is that by which we are saved. But then we went on to make a couple of vows. We made promises. The first one was that we will forsake this world, resist the devil, and put our sinful desires to death that we may serve our Lord and live as He calls us. Boy, does that sound familiar? That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Okay. So that, that's kind of a full vow, but that's the first one. The second one is this, that we will faithfully worship and serve the Lord and submit to the government of this church and listen to their correction if we should stray. Now again, those are things that we've promised and we need to make sure that we, we keep those promises because it's really the Lord who, to whom we're accountable. And He understands that there are times when we can't make it. I mean, He knows that. He knows that if we have, it's when we have the ability and we choose not to, then we're breaking this vow if we don't do these things. And again, these are pretty comprehensive. So, I believe the gospel, and I'm going to live the life that Christ calls me to live by His grace, though very imperfectly, we're going to do it very imperfectly. That is our commitment. That is our heart. And we know God will give us the grace to do it, and He will forgive us where we fail. Now, here's another interesting thing. If we've had our children baptized, we need to remember that we also made promises, oaths at that time, and, you know, that, that may be irrelevant for some of us because uh, we, they're already raised. But we promised to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And to set an example before them of godly living. Again, we do that. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And by the way, even though our, our children are raised, we still need to give them that example. And we still need to encourage them to trust in Christ. Um, 
we need to take these things seriously. We need to do them conscientiously before the Lord, again, realizing that we will do them very imperfectly. Now, Jesus obviously kept his promise to his Father. All the promises, the covenant, we call the covenant of grace, you know, this agreement between the three members of the Godhead when Jesus comes into the world to be and to do all that the Father required of us in order that He might guarantee our salvation, that He might be our Redeemer. Jesus fulfilled it to the letter. He did absolutely everything, and He is our model. He is our example. So we definitely do need to keep ours, and where we have failed to do this, we need to repent. And we need to renew our commitment to keep these vows, these, these oaths. That's actually what we do every week before we come to the Lord's table. We need to make sure that we renew our commitment to follow the Lord. Now, here's another thing that is a little bit scary. And that is there many of our children, you know, that we raised in this church, they took these oaths and they made these vows. And many of them have actually broken them. Have, have abandoned Christ, okay? So what do we need to do? Well, we need to continue to pray for them. We need to encourage them to repent. Um, and, of course, for others we know who have done the same thing, who not, aren't necessarily our children, because they made promises to God that they didn't keep. And God says, and it's a scary thing, He will not leave them unpunished. They have increased the judgment that is on them for breaking these vows. Now I'm assuming that they're not, they're unbelievers. If they reject Christ and they don't, they don't follow Him, they don't go to church, they won't name His name, they don't belong to Him regardless of the profession they made. Okay? They, they do not belong to Him. If they are not walking with Him, that should be the way we view them. And if that is the case, they have added to their judgment. We need to pray for them that they would repent because they have taken His name in vain. Okay? All right. Well, as I've said, there are other ways the commandment can be broken, and uh, the, the next one is one perhaps we're most familiar with, and that is when his, you know, that would be to use his name in a way that dishonors him. When we abuse his name, we are abusing him. Again, remember the connection between the name and the person. If I, you know, speak your name and I say something derogatory about it, I'm not saying something derogatory about your name. I'm saying something derogatory about you, okay? The name is a designation of that person. So when we dishonor his name, we are dishonoring him. Now, his name can be dishonored when it's used as a common curse word. That's something that's become so common in our culture that, you know, we're like the frog in the kettle, we just get used to hearing it. But it should always offend us when the one whom we love is dishonored in this way. Hearing it so often, we need to make sure we guard ourselves against falling into the same practice. Because, you know, if you hear a word long enough, you can find it coming into your mind and sometimes into your vocabulary. So you need to be very, we all need to be very, very careful there. Now, it can also be dishonored through blasphemy. And blasphemy means to speak against him, to insult him, or to slander him. We need to make sure that we never blame God, because blaming God is actually blasphemy for the things that he brings into our lives that are difficult. You know, God does bring testing, and we've all experienced it. We just need to be careful, because we know that everything that God does is good, and it's right. And if we love him, it's for our good, even though it's difficult, right? We, so realize that if you're suffering from something, some situation, some physical ailment, it's, it is God's will. Um, I, again, I remember James Montgomery Boyce, what he said when he was suffering from liver cancer that was terminal. He said, this is God's will. If I could change things, I wouldn't because this is what he has planned for me, and I know it's good. That, that's, you know, it takes a great deal of faith and trust in the Lord to be able to say that. But that's exactly what it means to honor His name, to trust Him. Now, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, the scribes, you know, they're, they're an example of people who very much honored the name of God. Remember the scribes, their job was to copy the Scriptures. 
And they're a good example of those who are very conscientious when they came to the name of God. And apparently, maybe they thought this only applied to the covenant name of God, you know, Yahweh. But they would cere ceremonially bathe before they would write it, you know, and there's some books in the Old Testament that that word appears quite a bit, so they, you know, had to bathe a number of times. But every time they wrote it, they would always ceremonially bathe before they did it. And then, because they wanted to be careful not to use his name in vain, they also would never speak his name, okay? When the Masoretes, uh, the, the Jewish group that were working on the Hebrew text, uh, I understand they started... Um, Oh, it could have been 7th, 8th, 9th century, but they actually finished the text in the 11th century. I'm not sure why it took so long. But they wanted to have a, you know, what you'd call the authorized version of the Hebrew text. But there was something unique about that text. The text up to that point, the, the Hebrew Old Testament, didn't contain any vowel pointing. You know, if, if you've studied Hebrew at all, you know that like our language, there are consonants and there are vowels. Well, their text contains all consonants for the most part. There are some exceptions to that, but all consonants. As a matter of fact, if you went to um, Israel today and you picked up a newspaper, <laughs> you know, you'd be confronted with all this, you know, all this Hebrew lettering. But in that Hebrew lettering, you'd be looking at an all consonantal text. You know, there are only consonants. It would be hard for us to read our English without vowels, okay? But they could do it. They recognized the words. They knew what they, what they mean. They knew how they were pronounced. But the Masoretes wanted to make sure that the pronunciation of the language was not lost. So they added vowel points. And these vowel points told you how to pronounce these words with the vowel sounds, okay? Well, when they were doing this, they didn't use vowel points. The vowel points for Yahweh when it came to the name Yahweh. You know, there's four letters in Hebrew that represent, you've heard of the Tetragrammaton. Those are the four letters of his name. They didn't use the vowel points for Yahweh, uh, which is why we still really are not quite sure how to pronounce it. But they used the vowels for Adonai, which means Lord, and another word, Hashem, which means the name. And when they read his covenant name in the text, then if it was pointed with the vowels from Adonai, they would pronounce Adonai, and if it's from Hashem, they would pronounce Hashem, or the name. So they didn't want to dishonor the Lord by using his name irreverently. So again, just super meticulous about the covenant name of God, and, and we ought to be as well. But we need to realize this command also applies to everything that God uses to reveal himself, okay? every name that applies to God. We need to be careful that that name is used reverently. But, but there are other things that are connected to the name of God and to God that we need to make sure that we also honor because anything by which the Lord reveals himself, we are to be, treat in a special way. So here's some things we don't often think about this commandment actually applies to. It, it applies to the creation. God made it. It reveals who He is and what He is. He is dishonored when we give credit for this creation to random processes or evolution. Right? Hopefully we don't do that here. Uh, you won't find me doing that. We, we, we know God created all things. It, it's not the process of billions of years and atoms colliding together. That dishonors God. certainly applies to His Word, the Bible, or special revelation. He is dishonored when people affirm that it's merely a collection of myths and legends, that his laws are outdated and out of step with society, that his justice is vindictive or capricious. We're going to actually hear more about that this evening. So God had, has revealed himself uh, through his creation and certainly through his word, we need to make sure that as these also are revelations of God. By the way, every name that God uses about himself is a revelation of who he is, isn't it? Yahweh, there's uh, the question of what does the word Yahweh mean? Well, he gave an exposition of it to Moses when Moses asked to see his glory. He says, I am who I am. And that's really what Yahweh means, I am. Uh, I am the eternally existing one. 
and every one of his names says something about him. Well, the creation says something about him. The Word of God says something about him. They are revelations of God. We need to treat them uh, carefully. Now, here's some more examples, and these I'm just going to read the examples that I've gleaned from the Ligonier website and just give you um, sort of a caption of what it's talking about um, so we don't miss the point. So, God is dishonored, and they see all of these as applications of the third commandment. He's dishonored if we swear an oath or a vow by any other name than his. So, quote, we, of course, take his name in vain when we make a vow by anything other than him. For when we do this, we are, we are setting up something else as the standard of truth. God is the only standard of truth and the only one who can bear witness to the veracity of men's hearts. So I don't swear on my mother's grave, you know, or anything like that. I swear by the name of God. He alone bears witness and can affirm or deny what I'm, what I'm professing. When we profess his name, now this is something else, when we profess his name, we call upon God as our God, but we don't live up to that profession. It's pretty broad, okay? This is, this is again what we find. Or a quote from Ligonier, quote, the taking of God's name in vain, however, has to do more with more than vows. Anytime we use his name in derision or whenever we insult or profane his name through irreverence or in our manner of... of in our manner or speech, we are treating his name as if it meant nothing. We also treat him derisively. When we make a profession of him but do not live up to that profession, those that name the name of Christ but do not depart from a life of iniquity, name it in vain. Their worship, therefore, is vain and their religion is vain. Okay, so here's another way. When we give him lip service, but not heart service in our worship. Quote, we might think ourselves free from committing any great crime when we worship God only with our mouths and not our hearts. When we make false promises, when we profess the name of Christ, but still harbor iniquity in our hearts, when we use God's name lightly or for swearing, God, however, does not hold us guiltless. So serious is this crime that God says he himself will be the avenger of those who habitually take his name in vain. Then they will find it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We dishonor his name when we say things that he has not said. We misrepresent God. And here, I think... And again, this comes from several different articles. None of them are signed, so I don't know who the authors were, but I, you know, it comes from Ligonier. But I think he's targeting here people in the charismatic movement. Quote, Christians can misuse God's name in saying things like, the Lord moved me to tell you when we feel that a friend needs to hear a special word. Yet this intuition does not necessarily find its origin in God's prompting. And we should not attribute words to the Lord unless they are found in Scripture. Otherwise, we might put false words in his mouth and inadvertently make him a liar. By the way, this is in an exposition of the third commandment, okay? Okay, another way. When we worship him in a way other than what he's commanded, he's saying that this also goes back to the second commandment. Quote, this rule is tied closely to worship. As we lift up the name of the Lord in our corporate praise, when we call upon His presence and grace, consequently, we must never worship God in a corrupt manner or in a way He has not appointed. Similarly, we take the, names, the Lord's name in vain when we profess His name in public, but do not love Him and His law. I'm a Christian, but I'm dishonoring His name by the way that I live. There's actually several references to that in these quotes. John Calvin writes in his Institutes, we ought not to be so disposed in mind and speech that we neither think nor say anything concerning God and his mysteries without reverence and much soberness, that in estimating his works we conceive nothing 
but what is honorable to him. Okay, then just a couple more. This next quote is a little bit lengthy, but very good. We dishonor him, and this again is building on what we've already seen. We dishonor him when we do not live up to his name that was placed on us. And he's going to say placed on us in his benediction, placed upon us in our baptism. Okay, because this ultimately is the Lord Again, putting his name on us and identifying us as, as his, okay? So this is what the author writes. Think about this in terms of the two testaments of the Bible, old and new. You remember that in the days of the Old Testament, the high priest was to bless the people. The specific blessing, sometimes called the Aaronic benediction, is recorded in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. These are beautiful words. And they describe a wonderful privilege, God shining on his people. Think about it. The face of God turning towards his people in love and smiling at them. But do you remember the words that follow? God says to the priest, number 627, So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I, <clears throat> and I will bless them. When the people of God received this blessing, God was putting his name on them. So to take the name of the Lord your God in vain was to be someone who accepted the Lord's benediction and then went away and lived as if he or she had never received it. It seems almost impossible, doesn't it, that someone would feel the smile of God and his benediction and then live as though it really didn't mean anything to him or to her? But before we look down our noses at Old Testament believers, I think we should remember the other occasion when God's name is said to be put on his people, and this time, people like you and me, if we're Christians. Do you remember it? Yes, it happened when you were baptized. You were baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hope we all understand that's a bigger blessing than the ironic blessing. But here's the challenge. Am I living as though that had never happened, or living as though my baptism was just an empty sign or merely a sign of something I did in the past, so it doesn't really matter so much today? If so, I couldn't be further from the truth. I couldn't be more deluded, really. I'm no longer on safe ground. Exodus 20 tells me I'm on dangerous ground. I've emptied the name of God that was put upon me of all of its significance. He pronounced a benediction but I forfeited the blessing by the way I live. Remember how Paul found himself writing about this in Romans 6 to counteract the idea that because God has been gracious to us, it doesn't really matter so much how we live or even if we dishonor God's name. You remember how he says, don't you know the meaning of your baptism? Don't you know that the name of Christ was placed upon you? If the name of the Lord has been put on you in baptism, then the rest of your life should be a life in which you give yourself entirely to the Lord whose name has been placed upon you. Those are sobering words, but they're true, aren't they? Because in our baptism, we are saying, actually, the Lord's putting his name upon us, but we realize that we belong to him and we are his. And so our goal in life is to serve him and to honor him. Now, one last thing that, again, seems far removed from this, but the psalmist says the commandments are exceedingly broad. You know, they, they, they are more than just the bare words. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, points that out again and again. So we're seeing a little bit of the breadth of this commandment, okay? Here's one last way we can break this commandment. And it's in the way that we treat other people. Interesting. Interesting. One is, quote, one way the name of God can be treated profanely is through cursing others. James 3, verses 1 through 12 is clear that to mistreat human beings is ultimately to mistreat the Lord himself because all people are made in God's image. To abuse and disrespect the part of creation that most reflects the Lord is to abuse and disrespect the creator who made us to reflect his glory there are innumerable ways to abuse and harm other people, but an often overlooked violation of the third commandment is the sinful cursing of men and women 
as the Westminster Larger Catechism indicates in question 113. Sinful cursing includes maligning the character of others, spreading rumors and gossip, and more, all of which are lesser forms of blasphemy against God. Who, who would have thought the third commandment applies to the way we treat our neighbor? Well, the point is, think about, think about everything that's just been said and think about Jesus. What did Jesus do? Well, Jesus swore only by the name of God. He called only on his name. He, prof he lived up to what he professed. He worshiped God with his whole heart, not just with his lips, as he directed. He spoke only what the Father was saying. He lived as one who bore his name. And he loved his neighbor as he loved himself. Well, the Lord has saved us, hasn't he? And given us his spirit so that we might do the same. Now again, have we succeeded? Now we've, we've failed in many, many ways we've failed. We're, we're not going to be perfect in this life. But we don't say, as, as Paul's addressing in Romans chapter 6, well, let us sin that grace may abound. You know, God's gracious, I'll just let it go. Or it doesn't matter how I live, whether I'm fighting against this sin or not, because the Bible actually tells us, the Lord tells us in his word, that if we belong to him, we will be seeking, as Paul says in Romans 8.13, we will be seeking by the Spirit to put every sin to death. We will be striving to become like Christ, even though we're not going to attain it in this life. The problem is when we sit easy with it and say it's okay, it's not okay, to sin. God, the warning isn't there for no reason. He will not leave us unpunished. If we belong to him, that punishment was taken by Christ, but we should still pay attention to that because it's dishonoring to God. Anything that I have done that's been attributed to Christ, any one of those sins could have condemned me to hell forever, but Christ has borne them for me, and he has saved me from them, and my response should be to seek to become pleasing to the Lord even as he was pleasing to his father. And that's particularly important as we, as I said before, as we prepare to come to the table, because here we renew those oaths and vows that we've taken to the Lord uh, before we come to the table. Again, because of the warning connected to this table, we don't want to take it lightly. We need to realize the Lord is present with us. He is here to bless us. Uh, we need to see him by faith through the symbols he's given to us. By the way, this, the Lord's table has been called by Calvin and, and the Reformers a visible word. So this is the word of God that also something by which the Lord reveals to us his gospel and his saving grace. And we don't want to take this in vain either. We want to make sure that we you know, take it very seriously. So we're going to spend just a few moments in silent prayer. And we're going to ask uh, that the Lord forgive us of all of our sins, everything, anything he's exposed while we've been listening this morning, and that he renew us in our commitment to love him and to follow him with all our hearts. So let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.